<clears throat> so I'm going to start with requests for you. First, if you take a photo of me, please do not put it in Facebook or Instagram. That company is a monstrous surveillance engine. <clears throat> Second, please do not take a photo of me with an eye thing if it is putting in geolocations or if it might be uploading photos automatically. Please keep the light on the audience. Do not dim the lights, please. I don't want to fall asleep. That's not what I'm here for. If some of you want to sleep with me, maybe we could arrange it tonight, but not here in this auditorium. Your laptop has gone to standby. Oh. So, um, second, if you make a recording, audio, or video, and you want to distribute copies, please distribute them only in the formats that are favorable to free software, which are the AUG formats or the WebM format. Please do not distribute copies in MP anything. Especially don't let them be distributed in Flash which requires non-free software. So YouTube is not a good place. And don't distribute them with Windows Media Player, Real Player, or QuickTime. Please don't ever distribute anything through iTunes, which requires non-free software to download. Uh, Apple has intentionally broken free software that used to work to download from iTunes. So down with iTunes and down with Apple. <clears throat> and please make sure that the site doesn't lead people to run non-free software as they try to access it, which, I, which YouTube does. Unfortunately, the HTML5 option of YouTube requires running non-free JavaScript code. Now, you can get things from, from YouTube without non-free software if you use YouTube DL, but that's not what the site leads people to do. <clears throat> and please put on the recording the Creative Commons no derivatives license, because this is a presentation of my point of view. So, freedom in your computer depends on free software. Free software is the basis of all freedom in computing and all security in computing. <clears throat> now, when I say free software, I don't mean that it's gratis. I'm not talking about price. I'm talking about free as in libre or frei uh, or reye. It's supposed to be free as in freedom not as in price. So think of free speech, not free beer. And if your language has a clearer word, always use it. So if you're speaking French, never use the English term free software. Always say logiciel libre, it's clearer. And if you're speaking German, it's uh, freie software. It's, there's a tendency to use English words as if somehow they had more prestige. But here's a place where the English language has a flaw. It causes confusion. So if you've got another word in another language that's good to use, always use it. I make a point of saying gratis whenever I mean zero price. I do not use the word free to mean zero price because I want to make it clearer for people, at least to understand what I say. So, what is a computer? It's a universal machine that does a simple thing. It gets the next instruction, carries it out, and gets another instruction. And by giving it the right set of instructions, you can make it do just about anything. Well, not absolutely anything. There are some limits. Maybe in 50 years we'll be able to do this as well. Uh, <clears throat> so the question is, who gives the instructions to your computer? Well, you're typing on the computer, maybe you think you're giving it instructions, but uh, it's running a program, and if that program wasn't written by you, then you're not actually giving it the instructions. Somebody else is, <laughs> who may not have your interests at heart at all. <clears throat> so, this is the crucial question, and you, it may look like the I thing is obeying you, 
but really it's obeying somebody else's orders first of all and serving you as much as the somebody else is willing to allow it to. <clears throat> so basically with software there are two possibilities, either the users control the program uh, or, the progr or the program controls the users. Well, when the, for the users to control the program, they need the four essential freedoms. And those freedoms are the criterion for free software. So if the program give, comes with the four essential freedoms, it's free software because that means the users control the program. <clears throat> so what are these freedoms? Well, wait, this is, these are in the wrong order. Wait, I fixed this. <clears throat> I may have the wrong version. How do I tell it to... I don't know how to get out of this mode either. I'm stuck. Okay. I'm not, I don't find these graphical interfaces very clear, you see. No, this is still the wrong order. Uh, so, uh, so if the users don't control the program, then the program controls the users and somebody else controls the program. So that program is actually a yoke to control the users. It giving, gives the somebody else, in this case Microsoft, power over those users. A non-free program is an instrument giving somebody power over the users. It's a yoke. It's, uh, it's an injustice and non-free software should not exist. So here are the four freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. So you can run it in whichever computers you wish, as many computers as you wish, do whatever you wish with it, use it in the fashion you wish for whatever purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to change the program, to study the source code and then change the source code so the program functions as you wish and does your computing the way you want it to do. <clears throat> now, Freedom 1 requires the source code because executables are incomprehensible, basically. To figure out what they do is a hard job called reverse engineering. So the point is, it's supposed to be easy for people to change the program and make it do what they want. So to be free software, it's got to come with source code. But what if you're not a programmer and you look at source code and you think, what in the world is this? It's true. With freedoms zero and one, the each user separately gets control over the program, and that's not much good if you don't know how to program. Yes, you could pay a programmer to make the change for you, the same way you could pay carpenters and plumbers and painters to change your house. But really, separate control is not enough. We need collective control which means that a group of users can work together to exercise their control over what the program should do, you know, taking out parts and adding parts. And in this group, some of the people have to be programmers. If nobody were a programmer, they'd still be lost. But they don't all have to be programmers. So the, the non-programmers can be participating in the decisions about what the thing should do, even though they don't write the code. Now, the group doesn't have to be everybody in the world. In this image, you see that there are uh, two people who are using the program, and they're not participating in that group. Well, they could. If the others want to work with them, they could make their own group, they could join with other users, or they could just stay on their own and exercise individual control. 
So this requires two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to redistribute the program, to make exact copies and give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. With these two additional freedoms, the members of any group are free to cooperate adjusting the program to fit their needs or desires, and they can also offer it to the rest of the, the world, to the public, if they wish. So what happens when the users do not control the program? Then the program controls the users and the owner controls the program, so that's a system of unjust power. The purpose of a non-free program is to subjugate people. And typically that leads to malicious functionalities. Many of the most widely used non-free programs are malware. Now, note that malware is a totally different kind of issue, a different concept. The difference between free software and proprietary software is a matter of how the program is distributed to users, on what conditions, for instance, it's distributed. And the same code, any code, could be distributed as free software. Any code could be distributed as proprietary software. Sometimes the same code is distributed both ways in parallel. So it's a matter of how the code is distributed. <clears throat> it's not a technical issue. It's not a technical distinction between free and proprietary. Technical distinctions are things like, what features does the program have? How do they work? How was the code written? Those are all technical things. This is a social, ethical, and political distinction, which is why it's so important. <clears throat> so, The use of a free program in society is development in social terms. Every program embodies knowledge. If it's free software, that knowledge is available to the users. They can read the source code and understand how it works. Then they can maintain, adapt, and extend the program and use their knowledge in other ways too. But the use of a proprietary program in society is not development. It's dependence, imposed dependence on one particular entity, the program's owner. That is a social problem. When we see people using non-free software, we should aim to put an end to that social problem. To develop a free program is a contribution to society. How much depends on the details. Obviously, if it's a very useful program, it contributes a lot. If it hardly works at all, it contributes very little. But if it's free software, it's distributed in such a way that it does contribute whatever it has to offer. But Developing a proprietary program is no contribution because it's a power grab, an attempt to subjugate people. In social terms, this non-free program is a trap. If it has attractive features, those are the bait. Paradoxically, they do not make it better. Rather, they make it more dangerous and more harmful. So if you have the choice to contribute to proprietary software or do nothing at all, Ethically, you must do nothing at all, because that way you don't do harm or wrong or injustice. <clears throat> of course, in real life, you'd probably have other choices which are better than both of these, so take them. But if we limit the consideration to just these two options, contribute to proprietary software or do nothing, doing nothing is superior. You see, a free program is better than nothing, and a proprietary program is worse than nothing. <clears throat> so for instance, uh, what if you have no money and you need to eat something, you're hungry, well, you don't have to limit yourself to these two options because you've got a better option, which is steal some food. <laughs> mm. 
It's not exactly nice, but it's better than developing proprietary software. <laughs> That's really wrong. <clears throat> of course, civilized countries would provide you with some food, you know. Not mine, though. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> the idea of the free software movement is all programs should be free so that all their users can be free. But I was starting to talk about malware and explain how it's a different issue from free versus proprietary because malware means a program designed to run in a way that hurts the users. So it's purely a question of what features or functionalities it has. Philosophically, free versus proprietary and malware or not are totally unrelated issues. But in practice, they go together. Proprietary software tends to be malware. What does it do to people? Well, it spies on people. This is something that the I things really did, reporting on where people went in stores. Apple could extract lots of personal information remotely from an I thing. The Amazon swindle reports what page of what book is being read. It's a monstrous spy device. It also has a universal back door, I believe. Uh, then there's the notorious Blu-ray that attacks users and stops them from doing things. This is DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, the malicious functionality of refusing to do what you want it to do, what you obviously were going to want it to do. And then there are back doors, like the one in the Amazon swindle that allows Amazon to remotely delete books. They deleted thousands of copies of the book 1984 in an Orwellian act. <clears throat> and then there are the devices that are jails, which impose censorship of application programs. Apple started this, uh, and the users themselves said that when they found a way to defeat the censorship, they called it jailbreaking, recognizing that these computers are jails. Microsoft followed Apple. Microsoft is building jails, too. And then there is sabotage. Sony sabotaged all the PlayStation 3s, telling the users they had to uh, either install a downgrade, which would deny features, deny the ability to install other operating systems such as GNU plus Linux, or they would be unable to talk to Sony's game network. So the product was sold with two features and then Sony told them to throw away one or the other. Sabotage. <clears throat> Sometimes there are universal backdoors. For instance, Windows has a universal backdoor. Microsoft can remotely impose software changes. And then there is another kind of sabotage when Microsoft tells the NSA about bugs in Windows before it fixes them, essentially attacking all its own customers. Well, what this means is lots of proprietary software that lots of people use is actually malware, and they're just getting dragged along by this malware and in fact, most users of proprietary software are victims of proprietary malware products. And I've proved it with this list of examples I showed you, because most of them are using those. Oh, by the way, nearly all portable phones have a universal backdoor, and it has been used to convert them into listening devices that listen all the time and transmit whatever they hear except the NSA has an improved version that recognizes certain keywords and only transmits the interesting conversations. <clears throat> and you can't stop this by shutting it off because it's part of the change is it pretends to shut off. It shuts off the screen, it looks like it's off, but it's still running, listening, and transmitting. The only way to stop it is to remove all the batteries, including the secondary batteries that can't be removed. <clears throat> so nearly all users of proprietary software are being victimized by proprietary malware. 
Of course, the reason they do this is typically for profit. It's not that they're sadists that enjoy mistreating people. No, they're totally egoistical, and they do this for profit. Uh, like they, the more users they make captive, the more they can sell to somebody else. And in effect, proprietary software is all a swindle. And they're not even ashamed of it. They have conferences where they talk about their latest advances in how to make users captive and mistreat them. In effect, the proprietary software world is one where the ethical standards of treating the customers or the users have disappeared. Any mistreatment of those users is okay. There may be some pesky laws or regulations they have to find an excuse to bypass, like getting all the users to click and say, okay, uh, Nintendo discovered it needed the users to say okay to something that they hadn't said okay to before, so it remotely installed uh, bricking software in every Wii U, uh, so that they all start, all refused to run until the user said okay to a new, a new end user license agreement. So where can you escape? We have built the place to escape too. It's the GNU plus Linux operating system. <clears throat> so where, how did it come about? Well, in 1984, in 1984, I started developing the GNU operating system. I said the system was going to be entirely free software. So, <clears throat> I started writing some pieces. I wrote some pieces. I recruited specific people to write other pieces. In some cases, I persuaded developers to free their software, like BSD. BSD existed already in 1983 when I announced the GNU project. It was a proprietary modified version of Unix. You couldn't get the source code of BSD except by showing UC Berkeley your AT&T source license, which cost $50,000. So I visited the people developing BSD and I said, AT&T is not a charity. Why are you donating your work to AT&T? Please separate your code out and release your code as free software. So and of course, the reason I wanted them to do this is so we could use those programs as part of the GNU system. And a couple of years later, they started doing that. By 1992, we had almost all of an initial Unix-like operating system, but the one component that was one essential, major essential component was missing the kernel, which is the component that allocates the computer's resources to everything else you run. In 1992, Mr. Torvalds, who had a proprietary Unix-like kernel called Linux, freed it. In 1991, when he started it, it, it was released as proprietary software. But in 92, he made it free, and the combination of GNU and Linux was a complete free operating system. For the first time, you could buy a PC and run it in freedom. So, in some basic sense, GNU plus Linux is free software, but when you find it in real life, often non-free programs have been added to it. So you might find non-free applications at the top and non-free drivers at the bottom, and uh, the result is you've got a system that doesn't entirely respect your freedom. Nowadays, the way you get GNU slash Linux is at, as a distribution or distro. Well, there are over a thousand distros, and nearly all of them contain non-free software, but there are a few that are entirely free, entirely freedom respecting. Look at gnu.org slash distros for the list, 
We also explain for the well-known non-free distros why they fall short. What's, what non-free stuff do they have in a general sense? Tuka? Hmm. I see that these slides still need some work, although I thought I had corrected all these things. So there are still problems. Uh, just because we have a free operating system doesn't mean we end up with freedom completely. Well, first of all, first of all, uh, <clears throat> I should explain something about free software and security. Free software is the basis, the necessary basis for cybersecurity. If you can't see what's going on in the program and you can't fix it, you're totally helpless. And that means you can't, you can't make it secure. You have no chance to try to make it secure. In addition, every non-free program is under the control of its developer which means it gives you zero security against the developer or any of the developer's friends or anybody that infiltrates the developer. Uh, think of Microsoft showing the bugs to the NSA. All users of Windows are suckers. <laughs> but we don't know, I don't know about any other companies that show bugs to the NSA like that, but any company might or might not. The point is, with non-free software, you can never check it f to see whether there is, there's a backdoor. You can't tell if the company is going to sabotage you. Every non-free program demands blind faith. It's the only possible basis for trusting it, it blind faith. So all non-free software does computing for suckers. <clears throat> so the only way you begin to have a chance to make something secure is if you have control over it. In other words, it's got to be free software. When the user is a government, it could afford in many cases, to hire people to check everything. It could, you know, uh, the German government could afford to have five independent teams that don't know about each other check over all the source code of all the programs in its favorite GNU slash Linux distro. You and I can't afford to do that, but we're part of a community which more or less does this job. <clears throat> which is better than being users of proprietary software where nobody's permitted to do this job. Uh, free software is the only known defense against malware and therefore it's the only possible basis for cybersecurity. <clears throat> the users of proprietary software are defenseless, they're helpless. So even though our defense against malware is not perfect, it's a lot better than being defenseless. And it's the only defense that anyone knows of. Security requires that users have control of their software. Of course, it's harder than that, because security also means perfection in exercising that control. Being perfect is hard, which is why security flaws show up. I don't have a solution for that problem. I don't know how we're going to be perfect. I do know that perfectly exercising our control over our software depends on having control over our software. So I can, I can take you to the jumping off place to try to have security. And proprietary software won't take you anywhere near that jumping off point. We don't just do things inside our own computers now. We use the net and we find other ways of attacking our freedom there. For instance, many web pages contain non-free programs written in the JavaScript language, but really 
which language they're written in doesn't change anything. Those programs can be free or non-free, just like any other programs. And they can be malware also. A lot of them are designed to recognize who the user is. <clears throat> then there's another way to lose control of your computing, which is SaaS, Service as a Software Substitute. This is when a service offers to do something for you, which is your own computing and which in principle you could do in your own computer by running your copy of the appropriate free program. Well, since that's your computing, you deserve to have control over it. If you let somebody else's server do it for you, and Google is not the only one, uh, and it's the same issue no matter who it is, uh, then you lose control, and uh, what that means is, <clears throat> well, the scenario is, to use SAS, you have to send all the pertinent data to the server. And then the computing is done by programs in the server, which you can't see or touch. And then they have results and they send them back to you. Or else it takes action on your behalf. And either way, you don't control that computing. By allowing it to be done in that server, by programs chosen by the server owner, rather than in your computer by free programs chosen by you, you lose control, you lose control over that computing activity. Now, if you run a non-free program to do it, you also lose control. But it's a different mechanism that causes you to lose control in both cases. However, the result is the same. You're doing computing that you don't have control over. Someone else controls it. SAS is inherently equivalent to running a non-free program, but it's even worse. Since you have to send all the data to the server first, in effect, it's equivalent to spyware. It's equivalent to running a, pro a program that sends your data to a server. In addition, I explained that m some non-free programs have universal backdoors. For instance, Windows has a universal backdoor. The Amazon Swindle, nearly all portable phones, and I think Google Play has a universal backdoor too. Auto upgrade that you can't turn off is a universal backdoor. Uh, the Nintendo Wii U obviously has a universal backdoor that Nintendo used to sabotage them and brick them all. Uh, <clears throat> well, a universal backdoor means that somebody has the power to remotely change how the user's computing is done without asking the user. SAS means the server owner at any time can install different software and thus change how the user's computing is done without asking the user for permission. Now, it's right that the server owner has the power to install different software in his computer. He should be free to do that. The bad part comes from using it as SAS, but that is the result. So SAS is inherently equivalent to running a non-free program, which is spyware and has a universal backdoor. <clears throat> so the only solution is don't use SAS. For instance, translation servers of any kind, they're SAS. Now, <clears throat> we have to fight back for instance, we have to protest whenever the representatives of the companies that mistreat people show up to speak, recruit, or whatever. If there's an Apple or Microsoft or Adobe or, or et cetera, recruiting team coming to your university, well, organize a protest and teach, explain to people why, it, why that company is doing harm. Some schools actually sell proprietary software or hardware with proprietary software installed. It's good to protest those activities too. <clears throat> so we need to free ourselves by coming to GNU slash Linux, but we have obstacles to face, to cross before we get there. 
For instance, these companies have a lot of power and they make a lot of money for it. They're not going to let go of their captives easily. We're going to have to push and we're going to have to push hard. Another obstacle comes from the fact that the mainstream media have forgotten about free software. When they talk about our work, they call it something else. They call it open source. That term was coined in 1998, which is 14 years after we started developing GNU, by people in the free software community. They were real participants. They were users, distributors, developers, and so on. But they didn't agree with the free software movement. They didn't agree that users deserve freedom in their computing and that, that this means control of their own software. So. They wanted a way to disconnect free software from the ideals of the free software movement. They did this by coining a term that hadn't been used before, which was open source. Then they had the chance to construct a different discourse around this term, which meant they could decide which ideas to include and which ideas to leave out. They left out the entire ethical foundation of what the free software movement says, and they present it purely in practical terms, where we say the values are uh, freedom and community. They say the values are code quality. They say, we, we say if you distribute a program, it is ethically incumbent on you to respect the four freedoms to let the users change and redistribute the software. That's the only way you can treat them decently and respect their freedom. They, in the, op the open source people say, if you distribute a program, it could be in your practical interest to let users change and redistribute the software because then they'll improve it. They'll give it better code quality. So they've changed the values. For us, freedom and community. For them, code quality. They've replaced, it is ethically incumbent on you. This is the only way you can treat them right with, it may be in your practical interest too. So they don't say that proprietary software is wrong. This is the big difference in substance between what they say and what we say. This is why I never use the term, quote, open source, unquote, or, quote, closed source, unquote. I have made sure I never use those terms. I mention them inside quotation marks. <laughs> but I don't use them. You can help the free software movement by standing up for what we believe. So where the open source boosters are saying, we would like better quality, join us in saying, we demand freedom. Not just we would like freedom. No, we demand freedom. And we're ready to fight for it. We're ready to make sacrifices for it. Because sometimes freedom requires a sacrifice. <clears throat> That's what open source doesn't teach people, that, because it doesn't say that something important is at stake. Why would you make a big sacrifice or even a small sacrifice for better code quality? That's desirable, but it's not really important, so you wouldn't make a sacrifice. You don't sacrifice convenience to get convenience, but for freedom, maybe you will sacrifice convenience. <clears throat> I should point out that I also reject the term open hardware. I use the term free hardware designs, because that's, after all, what you can, co you can copy. There, there isn't a copier for digital circuits, but there are copiers for designs for digital circuits. You can't edit a digital circuit a, a, a digital piece of hardware with your computer, but you can edit a design for one with your computer. The real analogy is between software and hardware designs, and it's important to push for free hardware designs. If you design hardware, please make your designs free. And part of the reason for this is that often 
an obstacle we encounter is the specs of the hardware are secret. We, they'll sell us the hardware, but they won't tell us how to run it. They won't tell us what commands it needs. Instead, they say, here's a non-free program to run our product. Run it and shut up. Well, we can't have freedom if we're running that non-free program. We need reverse engineering. Every university should teach reverse engineering, focusing on... <clears throat> Focusing on figuring out the specs for hardware. <clears throat> and in the meantime, choose the devices that don't require your system to install non-free firmware into them. Schools must teach free software. They must teach the civic ideas of free software, which I'm telling you today, and also the software they teach the students to use must be free, because the school has a social mission to educate good citizens of a society that is strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free. <clears throat> so, <laughs> teaching kids to use proprietary software is like teaching them to smoke tobacco. <laughs> Wait a second. This is funny. Uh, I'm advancing here, but it's not advancing there. Oh, yuck. Well, that's too bad. I'll just... You don't get to see these, it looks like. Let's see if this fixes anything. No, it's not doing anything. It's just st that one's stuck on the old slide. I don't know how this is... What could cause this to happen? Uh, it is, but I don't. I didn't write this program. It, uh, I couldn't debug it here, I'm afraid. So uh, this shows somebody offering a disc with an apple on it and a pack of cigarettes to a kid. Uh, <laughs> But that's sort of what they, what they do, you know, tobacco companies did g offer gratis cigarettes to kids. And now computer companies offer gratis or low price copies to schools to get the students hooked. But uh, the schools, but to teach a non-free program to the students is implanting dependence in society, which contradicts the social mission of the school, so they shouldn't ever do it. In addition, when the school should have a rule saying, students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share it with the rest of the class, including the source code, in case someone wants to learn, because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, you're not allowed to bring proprietary software to class unless it's for reverse engineering, specifically. <clears throat> Another reason to teach only free software is so that uh, it's for the sake of the kids who have a talent for programming and they want to learn how these things work. So, uh, <clears throat> So if it's proprietary, it's a secret. They're not allowed to learn. Go ahead. Uh, it's really strange how, I don't know how this could show something different. Anyway, but if the program is free software, the teacher can explain what he knows and then gives, give each of those students a copy of the source code saying, read this and you'll understand everything. And those kids are fascinated, so they'll read it. And the teacher can then say, if you come across a point you can't figure out by yourself, show it to me and we'll figure it out together. And that's how our talented young programmer gets to learn that that code is badly written. Don't write it that way. How do you advance from being a talented, natural programmer to a good programmer? You have to learn what is 
clear code and what's not clear code. The way you learn that is by finding code that's hard to understand and then you know that's the wrong way. Uh, this might be the one to do it. Yeah. Ah, here, it's come back. Uh, <clears throat> so, free software permits education, proprietary software does not allow education. Thus, proprietary software is the enemy of the spirit of education and should not be tolerated in a school, except for reverse engineering. <clears throat> human rights depend on each other. If you lose one kind of human right, you tend to lose others as well. Now that we use software so much in our lives and in important social and public activities, free software is one of the human rights that the others depend on. We must insist on establishing a society of free software. This does require sacrifices occasionally. Uh, so how do you help? Well, you can write free software if you're a programmer. You can organize people to campaign for free software, to pressure schools and governments to change, to help other people change, to teach other people these ideas I've told you today. Uh, you can help other users start a GNU slash Linux user group. Uh, just by saying free software, especially if the other people around you prefer to say open source, will help us. They were the majority in 1998, ever and they're still the majority, and they've even misled people. People think that I'm an open source supporter. I've read articles that called me the father of open source. Ugh, what am I going to do? <clears throat> so I send a letter to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. <clears throat> But I can't do it all, we, you need to do it too. So, <clears throat> of course, free software alone won't block all the kinds of surveillance that they're doing to us. It prevents them from spying on you through your own computer. But what about tracking you on the street through uh, Wi-Fi, through uh, a mobile phone? If you carry one, I won't, uh, because I don't want to tell Big Brother where I am all the time. Uh, they can't, what about the cameras? <clears throat> now there's an algorithm to recognize, to track a person from one camera to another. Uh, you know, what about the license plate recognizing cameras that track all the cars? And if you pay for your, the bus or train with a card that is associated with your name, they track you there. What about all your phone calls? Basically, to make uh, digital technology safe for democracy, we need to stop governments from collecting enough data to identify the dissidents and the whistleblowers. Because when they identify them, they crush them. <clears throat> and without whistleblowers, we don't have democracy. We can't control what the government does if we can't find out what it's doing. So democracy depends on whistleblowers, which depends on people's ability to be whistleblowers and not be imprisoned for it. So how hard is that? If that requires the, if that requires the courage and knowledge and careful planning of a Snowden, we're not going to have very many whistleblowers. We have to make it safe and easy, which means we must redesign all the digital systems so that they do not accumulate digital dossiers about people. 
Take a look for this issue at gnu.org slash philosophy slash surveillance vs democracy.html for a lot of specific technical suggestions about how to do this. More generally, look at gnu.org slash distros for info on free gnu slash Linux distros. Look at gnu.org slash gnu for the history of gnu and explaining why you really should call it gnu slash Linux and give us equal mention. If you call it Linux, you're giving the credit for our work to someone who doesn't, who didn't do as much and started later and doesn't stand for our ideals either. And look at gnu.org slash licenses for more information on all the free software licenses. Almost every open source program is in fact a free program. Uh, the, the open source licenses that are actually used much are free software licenses. But of course, you have the choice. There's copyleft where you actively defend the freedom of that code for all users of all versions. And then there are the weak pushover licenses, like the two different licenses sometimes called MIT, and the B two different BSD licenses and the Apache license. They're different in certain ways, but they're all weak pushover licenses, lax licenses, because they permit proprietary versions of the code. Why open the door for someone to use your code to subjugate other people? Why not insist anything with your code in it has to re respect the freedom of its users? <clears throat> now it's time, oh also gnu.org slash philosophy has lots of articles about various political and philosophical and ethical issues and gnu.org slash help suggests ways to help us. Now it's time for the auction. This is an adorable GNU that needs a home. So I'm going to auction it for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation and then sell it to the winner outside because sales are not allowed here. So <laughs> if you buy it, I will sign the card for you. If you have a penguin at home, you need to get a GNU for your penguin because a penguin can't hardly function without a GNU. Please quiet, please quiet, there's not much time. Please quiet, please quiet. Let me continue now. Uh, we can accept payment in cash with a bank card if it can make international purchases by phone or with Bitcoin if you have something here to make the payment in front of me. Uh, and when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount so I can hear you and so I notice you. I'm going to start with the regular price of 20 euros. Do I get 20 euros? I, I got 20. Do I get 30? Is that you? Is, are, you, are, you are you the one who bid 200? Where? Who said 200? Could you stand up? The person who bid 200, is that you? Okay, I've got 200. Do I get 225? Do I get 225? 225 for this adorable GNU. 225 or more to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Do I get 225 or more? Is someone bidding? Stand up, please. Stand up, please, if you're bidding. Stand up if you're bidding. Okay, uh, it's too bad, I lost my glasses on the way here. I'm having trouble seeing. Hey, could you look for people and point out to me who you see? Uh, okay, I've got 225, do I get 250? You're bidding 250? I've got 250, do I get 275? Do I get 275 for this adorable GNU? 275, is someone bidding? Are you bidding? 275? I've got 275, do I get 300? Do I get 300? 300 for this adorable GNU? I've got 300. <clears throat> do I get 350? Let's move it along, do I get 350? 350 for this adorable GNU? By the way, outside, it, when this ends, they're going to be selling lots of much cheaper GNU merchandise. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> oh.
Okay, do I get, I, I've got, uh, do I get 350? Do I get 350? Do, do I get 350 for the Free Software Foundation? 350 for this adorable GNU? Last chance to bid 350 or more. Last chance. Last chance. Do I get 350 or more? Last chance. Going. Going. Gone for 300. Please come up. Will the person who bid 300 please come up? Please come to here so I... Okay, now I have time. Just wait around. I can't sell it now. I'll do it when we go out in a few minutes. If there, I can answer a small number of questions. Hello, we have uh, five minutes for questions now, and there are six numbered microphones for people who want to ask questions. Please line at the microphones in an orderly fashion and I call the number of... Okay, there is a question. Please be very brief. Don't, don't thank me. Don't apologize for asking. Don't explain anything. Just ask. We have a question at the back. Microphone number one, please. Uh, I want to run uh, free software on uh, computers which run uh, proprietary firmware. And it runs over, I communicate these computers over non-free uh, networks. I, can you comment on... It's a on meaningless thing to say the network is free or not. This concept of freedom applies to works. That is, things that are published and you can have copies, you can edit the copies, you can redistribute them. Uh, a network is a different kind of thing and different ethical issues apply to it. So you shouldn't start saying things like this network is free or non-free, services are not free or non-free. They raise other ethical issues like what do they do with your data? How much do they know about you? Uh, do they track you? Uh, are they SaaS? Uh, but basically, the non-free firmware is a problem if it if it is firmware that's not meant ever to be changed, we can regard it as part of the circuitry. It's equivalent to a circuit. That doesn't mean it can't be malicious. There's malicious circuitry in ordinary PCs too. But the hardware is a different kind of issue because we can't edit it and recompile. So what that means is, yes, it can be bad, but the solution that I worked out for software doesn't directly apply. Now, someday, we, we hope it will, someday we hope we'll have personal fabrication <clears throat> and we'll be able to make <clears throat> our own hardware with circuits that are not malicious and with firmware that's free and so on. <clears throat> that's a future step that you can help by developing free hardware designs now. <clears throat> but in the meantime, at least make the software free. There's very little time for questions, so if you're standing in line and you're not the first in line at the microphone, you're not likely to have the time for your question, for which we apologize. But have we question that microphone number two, please? Oh, um, many people would still might like to make a living out of selling their software, so which business model would you suggest? Okay, the first question is, they might, point is, they might like to do that, but if they, but that doesn't justify or excuse doing it in an unethical way. Proprietary software is an injustice. They shouldn't do that. Uh, but there are, there are many free software business models, like there is selling support, there is constructing custom solutions paid by the clients, you can deliver the solution as free software, the client's still gonna have to pay. Uh, there is crowdfunding. There's just plain asking for donations. There's a GNU package called Lily Pond for editing musical scores, and the maintainer gets enough money just from users that are happy and send it. There are others as well. There are big companies that fund development of useful free software. Governments fund a lot, especially in Europe. So, yes, there are ways to do this. But if you don't find one, that doesn't excuse non-free software. Next.
why why not why not add a condition to the license restricting organization which violated human rights in the last 10 years from using our software because uh, we can first of all if we if we allowed licenses that restrict freedom zero that limit how the program is used <clears throat> then we would find ourselves facing loads of different <coughs> limits <coughs> And the result would be a system you couldn't confidently use for anything. And the other thing is that in it, free licenses are based on, cop, on copyright. And copyright basically says once you've got a copy uh, in the normal way, you can run it as you like. For, so we couldn't really stop them. Uh, and they would get their governments to make exceptions for them. Mostly they are governments. Uh, they're not going to enforce their copyright laws against their own use. So it wouldn't work and it would destroy our community. There's an article about this where I've, I've explained it more clearly in gnu.org slash philosophy. Uh, you'll have to look for it. We only have time for one more question because this is the first talk of the day and we don't want to start getting a question at uh, microphone number five, please. Thanks. I want to thank you. So there are security benefits to uh, uh, jails on, on smartphones because it prevents 95% of users to, you know, fall for drive-by downloads. And similar, uh, you can say about... Um... Could you get to the point? Well, uh, is there an alternative? Yes. Uh, the benefit comes from the fact that it's checking whether code is signed by somebody. Now, if you t enable that voluntarily, and if you can choose <clears throat> who is the signer, and you, if you have a way you can turn it off when you really want to, then it's a useful feature. That can be done in free software. The re what makes it a jail is the fact that the users don't have a choice. They don't have control over it. Thank you very much, Mr. Stoman, and thank you to the audience. And please give us some applause. There's 3,000 people here, and I need to hear you applauding.